Yeah, Professor Lorenz. Professor Lorenz, you're a member of the Institute Advisory Board at the German MTL Association. Why? What do you hope to gain from this? In my view, the Institute is the MTM think tank. That is to say, the advisory board members, in conjunction with the Institute, seek to press ahead with further developments at MTM. And this is a very important matter. For in an age of rapid change, we constantly need fresh ideas and proposals, and the service support area has been very strongly promoted by the MTM Institute, and this is definitely a future area for MTM. In your experience, what role does MTM play in efficiency levels in service support areas? Well, in the past, we simply let too much slide here. If production was synchronized to the exact second or millisecond, this was simply not the case in the service support areas. We now need to ensure that we reach reasonable results there too as we face international competition and the pressure to cut costs. MTM can be very helpful here with its standardization processes and its systems. Not for every issue, but for many. We just need to make a start and the system will then continue to develop. It's the task of MTM to optimize processes by avoiding waste and providing specific designs for workstations and the work itself. Where is there any common ground with your work? And what are the points of contact? Well, the starting point is designing workstations. Then there's the process analysis work. But waste is a very important issue in offices. We're familiar with downtimes in the production department, but if you look at offices, they're far too high, some of them by 20 to 30 percent. So we need to see why this is the case. This involves many issues. People are looking for something because they didn't file it properly. These are the little things we all know about in the production area, and we need to try to transfer them to the office area and also attempt to get a better grip on the process in order to eliminate downtime, so that people don't have to wait for the results of work performed by others. Things need to be better coordinated. And I think we have huge reserves here that we can still exploit without burdening the employees with even more pressure or stress than they already have. What is your experience in practice? What kind of acceptance is there with employees when you arrive with your new ideas and design concepts? How do employees respond to it all? Well, employees always believe that the current method and what they're accustomed to is good. This starts with the shape of the office. If they've grown up with a cubicle office, then they'll love their cubicle office above all else. So you have to open their minds and take them by the hand in order to break new ground, and you need to discuss things with them and remove their sense of fear. You need to launch pilot projects that include them, and then they can see what benefits the new system provides. Particularly now, when we're looking at procedures, we're gradually trying to move towards a results-based system in offices, and this includes payment structures. In the past, this was always covered by agreements based on objectives, but agreements based on objectives do have a problem. Yes, I know the goal, but how do I get there? What hurdles do I need to overcome? Or perhaps there are none. I don't know. And this often creates a situation where people drive themselves too hard. In offices, they have a huge advantage. If they cannot do the work in eight hours, then they work nine or ten hours. That's impossible on a conveyor belt. If one person doesn't finish his work, the others have to wait for him. If we could design processes in offices better, things might run more smoothly, and employees then see that, but the inhibition levels are very, very high. Which work design tools do you use in your daily work? Which devices do you make use of? Well, it mainly involves tackling the issues that we've already mentioned, removing waste, providing optimization in the office area, optimizing methods, particularly the area of conflict between communications and concentration. We have to communicate at work in order to make progress together, but communication is always a disturbance for people who want to work in a focused way, and this gives rise to the design of the shape of the office. So there's plenty of variety. I use a whole range of methods in this area. I'd now like to simply mention a sequence of three key words, important terms which are related to MTM, and perhaps you can briefly state what significance these words have for you. The first is the important issue of ergonomics. 
Well, ergonomics is the most important to me, adapting technology to people and not the other way around. If we pursue this thought, rooms have to be adapted to people. Even working processes or the areas for decision-making have to be adapted to people. Real ergonomics is the basis for keeping people healthy, motivated and feeling good. It's a very, very important issue. I must express my regret over universities. When ergonomics professors retire, they're often not replaced. We've repeatedly heard at the conference today how important the issue of ergonomics is, starting with young people, so that when they grow old, and we're all getting older, they can still work in a successful and healthy way. This is very important. Yes, then there's the important issue tackled in depth by MTM, the issue of designing workstations. Yes, this is linked to it, of course. Workstation design is poor without ergonomics. It has to be derived from ergonomics and adapted to the organizational requirements of the work task at hand. Then the design of the workstation will be good. And the last word is process analysis. This is very, very important in the administrative area, or what we call the service support area, and is used much too rarely in my estimation, for it's the crucial key to open up what our valuation processes are, where we're wasting resources and where we can further optimize our procedures. It's a very, very important issue on the organizational side. We'd also be interested to hear which design errors, if we can call them that, you often encounter in practice. I believe business managers often think they have well-designed offices and you arrive and provide them with different information. Where do people need to catch up or where does ignorance often still prevail? Well, there are two approaches if you want to design something new. You need to involve the employees. There's an old principle, turn those affected into those involved, so that they're involved in the process because the process results will simply be better. That takes time. And many corporations don't want to take this time and say, oh, they're only involved in discussions and what will be the results? So they bring in some experts who come up with the solution and the tape is cut and the employee goes into his office and is then supposed to be delighted. That usually doesn't work. When it comes to errors, I have to say that they're usually unconscious errors. If corporations do something on their own, they want to do it properly. But they often lack the specialist knowledge and that is when errors are made, which do not need to happen, but which I naturally notice. I I say, the opposite of good is having good intentions. They've tried, but lack the specialist knowledge. This is a very complex matter, and you need an expert to get involved in order to design good solutions. We'd also be interested to hear how the opinions of employees and managers differ. The employees have very clear criteria with which they feel happy, and I think managers may have very different criteria which are important to them when it comes to designing offices. What's your experience? Not necessarily. In well-managed corporations, the two views harmonize because the corporations have recognized that their employees are the key to their success. And no corporation can survive for long without its key to success. It may be able to go on selling its products, but it needs new ones. And particularly here in Europe, we need innovative solutions, i.e. we need to have better and more interesting solutions, because we are expensive, than in any other competitive country. And this can only work if you have highly motivated employees. Corporations have understood that they justifiably have monetary goals. After all, they have to generate profits. Their investors want proper returns on the money that they have invested, and this only works if the corporations look after their employees. There are also some corporations that tend to deny this, but in the end you can see who is successful and who is not. The next question is definitely hard to answer, but I'm still going to ask it. We're also interested to hear when you are dealing with these sorts of issues, office design, work design, is there perhaps one project or one example where you can say, the improvements in design have specifically introduced improvements in productivity or in the employee's effectiveness? Can you quote any figures? It's difficult to come up with a percentage or figures. If, for example, there's a serious problem in many corporations where communications do not work, this is often related to the shape of the office. 
If we change the shape of the office and then assess whether communications have improved, we can say, yes, things are better. And if communications are important for engineers in design or project work, particularly in the development department, where various people have to work together, and I notice that communications have improved, the project will be completed faster and better. But the difficulty is usually that there are gaps in time between our analyses. You have a current situation at Corporation A, let's say in a particular office structure with a particular way of handling processes. You then change the process. You change the office structures, but this involves a time lag of one or two years. So much has changed in the meantime that it can no longer be transferred one to one. We can see that we're clearly improving, but it's often difficult to say that this or that was the crucial issue. You can get a grip on a process in its current state if you've measured a process in its current state and know how long it's taken, and if you've optimized it, then you'll appreciate the degree of improvement. But issues related to creativity like innovation, a sense of well-being at work, work satisfaction and the like, are not that simple, but you can measure them too. The next question is partly linked to the previous one. Do you often have to do some persuading as part of your work? You come to managers or the directors of corporations and say to them, there's potential for optimization here, things could be better here with a different design of office. And this is all linked to investments. Have you noticed a trend that directors are ready to make these investments? Or is the trend rather to say, no, we'd rather save the money? What's your experience? Or is the tendency eher so, that they say, no, we want to save the money and we'd rather save the What do you experience? It goes in waves. In the past, people understood that an office is not an end in itself, but is there to support the organization, a work task or the needs of employees. So you need to adapt the office too if the organization, tasks or processes change. That costs a bit of money, but there are some solutions which are not that expensive, but money will always be involved. Many corporations today are trying to find their salvation in an office shape by simply saying, I'm using a large open space and we'll put all the employees there and then I'll draw a virtual line between department A and B. And if the jobs grow or change, I will just move the line back and forth and try to save costs. But that won't work. I'm working on providing some evidence of this, but I cannot give you any results yet. So here's the last question I'd like to ask. What's the latest trend? Or perhaps you'd like to tell us about an innovation in your scientific work. We don't have any new knowledge in the field of designing workstations, but we do have corporations that have the courage to shape workstations in a completely different way so that they're better adapted to the ergonomic needs of their employees than they were in the past. That is one side of the coin. On the other hand, we can see in terms of IT equipment that we no longer just have one monitor, but two, and they're getting bigger so that we can view two or three or four pages next to each other. This brings enormous increases in productivity in double-digit terms. Everybody who works with monitors knows that. In the past, we printed so much on paper because we could then move things around quickly and process the pages. Now we use computers. I'm sure that these new technological developments will have a huge positive spin-off. On the other hand, we're having to work with monitors more and more. The time we spend in front of the monitors is becoming longer and longer. So we have to beware that our health does not suffer from this one-sided static work. Offices need to have areas where people can move around. So it's not just a question of optimizing the use of the last square meter. Professor Lawrence, that was a great final sentence in my view. And I have now asked you all my questions. Thank you very much for the interview.